Welcome back to the Shop of Hard Knocks. My name is Will Kelly, and I'm the monthly repair columnist for Vintage Guitar Magazine, as well as book author, guitar builder, and chief bottle washer here at Hard Knocks Guitars. I want to tell you about a really cool product I saw from a company I've recently become acquainted with, MGB Guitars. Uh, Michael Breedlove, who's the owner of the company, was a uh, responder to an email I sent him just asking him some questions about a product and he was very responsive and he told me basically in all terms that this is something I really want to try. So here it is. This is a this is neck through guitar blank. Now Firebirds and Jackson soloists from the 80s and various instruments have always used this traditional solid one piece of wood the whole way through the neck construction but it's typically been very expensive. You know, this is a paddle head, so you can do your own headstock design. It's got a built-in truss rod, rosewood fingerboard, nicely fretted, maple neck, two inch tongue extension, two inch wide and one and three quarter inch deep. So this is ready to rock by putting your own sides on the instrument, routing it for pickups, attaching bridge controls, things like that, and making a wonderfully built, home-built guitar. I'm going to show you the process that I use to turn this neck blank to something pretty amazing. And I'm going to do it using this huge uh, hunk of purple heart. So, uh, as I usually say about this stage in every video, let's get started on about. So, I've got a custom body shape that I've designed and worked up. And what I'm going to show you is my process for getting that drawing into a piece of wood, so to speak. So the first thing I'm going to use is I have this thick construction paper that's wide enough to trace the body on. And I've actually traced my template or my original body design twice on this, and I'll show you why. So here are the two traced out copies of the original body style that I've designed. And I'm just taking a razor blade and very smoothly tracing and cutting the outline from the uh, thick green cardboard. This makes wonderful template material for me because it's easy to visualize in contrast with lighter, darker woods. And so there's the basic first body. And I'll continue to trace these out and then I'll show you what we do with them. So I've glued one body template down onto this piece of uh, half inch, or actually five eighths inch plywood. This is going to be my main template. So I've glued one body down, and if you notice, it's in a reverse pattern, more like a Mose Rider or something like that. Um, it's my thing. So now we've got the neck blanks right here. So what I'm going to do is just kind of position this on here full length because we want to make sure that the uh, end of the template fits the end of the body, or uh, the neck blank rather. So that's lined up nicely, it looks good, and all I'm going to do is just trace this out. Right there. And now I know where my neck blank is going to go here, okay? And that's going to help me position the other template that I have right here. So what we're going to do is kind of superimpose this over this and I'm going to use the same cutout on this upper horn here to match the lower cutout there. So basically, I'm going to tear that off and it'll help you visualize it a little better. And then we want to make it almost full width. And there you go. So what I'm going to do now is glue this second template down on top just so that I can and then position the second neck as well. So we are going to mark out the neck position here and here 
Then I'm going to cut this off so it'll help glue better. So I've got the second template glued on top of the other one, positioned into a double neck arrangement. And now I'm going to lay out the, uh, the necks and the positions of the necks. Now we want the uh, length of the uh, neck tongue out here extending the whole way through the body, so this is going to be placed appropriately, which means I'm going to have to shave off some of this up here, but that's not a big deal. All right, so with the two necks on and situated perfectly, I think that we've got our basic layout. And then I've traced out these cutaways to coincide with the rounded bottom of the neck cutaway here. So I'll go ahead and recarve this. And then uh, I had to add a little bit here to make the lower bout a perfectly smooth and carved. But I'll refine that once I cut it out on the bandsaw. But this is basically what it's going to look like. For the body. So what I'm going to do now is I've marked out where the neck sections lie along the body and then I'm going to take these and cut these out on a bandsaw and separate the neck sections from what are going to be purple heart. Purple heart wood is going to be here, here, and here. These are going to be maple, which are the neck sections through. So now we've got our templates cut out, smoothed, leveled, checked. These are the three pieces of purple heart wood that we're going to use in between the neck throughs. So we've got this huge piece of purple heart. And uh, believe it or not, this wood when it's first cut is like a dull gray brown. But as the sun hits it, instead of fading, it gets brighter and brighter purple. So as you can see, it's just a beautiful color. And the contrast is just stunning. So we are going to use this for our intermediate body pieces. 
Now, when you're laying this out, this is very, very expensive wood, somewhere on the lines of $15 a foot. Okay, so this is about, it was an eight foot piece, so you can do the math. Just a chunk of wood like that's $100. So what you want to do is carefully nest and lay out your uh, templates so that you can serve as much of the wood as possible. Now, the grain's running straight this way, so obviously we need to orient the grain that way. All right, so if on this first piece there's a small defect right up here on the corner here. So what I'm going to do is mount this this way. It doesn't matter which way they're cut, whether it's laid out this way or this way. The shape is the shape. So we're going to go ahead and lay this out. Let's see. Yeah, like this. So that we miss this part completely. And we want to leave probably about an, a quarter to an eighth of an inch edge. In other words, don't line this up directly with the side because this is rough milled. It's not smoothed yet. So we're going to take care of that with a router. But uh, what we want to do is leave us enough of an edge so that we can mill it down to a perfect level but not waste any wood either. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and trace this out onto our purple wood. And this will be the general saw marks uh, that we use for a rough cut on the band saw itself. So there, so that's laid out. Now, when I talk about nesting and conserving lumber, the second thing is this, okay? I can put this second piece and nest the two in this way. So instead of having to start cutting out here, I can actually move this in about three or four inches. And that saves board feet. Okay? So the first piece will go here. Second piece we will nest in that way. And then once again, the middle piece has got this curved part for the uh, cutaways. So what we're going to do is just basically maximize that as well by placing that along one edge here. And uh, what we've ended up saving probably is about four, four inches or so of board length. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but at $15 a board foot, that's a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and trace these out, and then we'll cut them on individual sections on the bandsaw. And then what we'll do is we'll put them on a planer and mill them to the exact thickness of the neck tongue. And then we'll shape the sides, and we'll be ready for a glue up. But there's a little trick in between there that I'm going to show you. Okay, I've cut each purple heart blank to size for the template to be laid on top, traced out, and cut out. The next thing I'm going to be doing is taking each one of these blocks with the adjoining faces here, here, and here, and put them through a joiner planer just to make sure that they end up flat and square so that they'll uh, glue up properly. So that's the next thing we're going to do. So what we're going to do now is we've got these large planed and machined blocks of Purple Heart and they're going to be glued to the neck blanks but before we do that what we're going to do is we're going to create some veneer contrasting stripes or strips in between them. So what I've chosen is a couple of boards of uh, this is Mexican ebony it's called Catalox and then this is a, a very special wood it's called Hollywood yeah, I know, but uh, it's from the holly tree. Gibson used to face their peg heads with this before they'd apply their decals or their inlays and things like that on the 50s Les Pauls because this finishes so well. And it's a light bluish gray color, but it's a very good contrast to the darker Mexican ebony. So what I'm going to do is cut one and three quarter inch strips of this wood, and then we're going to end up gluing them to the board, uh, the purple heart, so that we get a good, nice contrasting stripe. So what you'll end up with is something along those lines right there. 
and uh, it's just visually interesting. Okay, I've got the strips cut, got my ironwood, uh, purple heart, and what we're going to do is start gluing everything together. And then once we've got all the faces glued firmly, spread out, and joined, we're going to clamp them together and let them set for a whole day because the moisture is something that the wood needs to take care of, absorb, and get rid of. So take your time to spread your glue out completely. Make sure that you don't leave any uh, big pockets of glue because that will actually become a bump and will prevent the wood from totally uh, bonding together smoothly and completely and invisibly. Okay, so spread this out. You've got a good set time on the wood glue. Um, if you've got an old jar or old tube of wood glue, throw it away, buy new glue. Um, it makes a real big difference when it sets. Okay, so there's the first piece. That's the uh, ebony. And then what we're going to do is just lay this right on top. This is the holly. And then once again, we're going to start with the sandwich of glue, wood, glue, wood, glue, wood, glue. Now, holly's a little bit more porous than ebony, so I'll put the glue on a little bit thicker so that it'll have time to, uh, you know, it'll absorb into the wood, but it'll still be enough to absorb into the other piece of ebony because, you know, we're not gluing the ebony. We're just gluing once in between joints. Okay, I take my finger. You can use a credit card, spreader, whatever. I just like my finger because I can really get a good distribution and get everything completely covered and clean. Okay, so there we go. Now I've got the ebony. I've got the holly. And now we've got the Purple Heart. Okay. Now, once again, we just keep starting with the, the sandwich, so to speak. Make sure we get this nicely spread out. Don't worry about drips and runs and things like that, because we're going to plane both sides of this once it's glued together and dried. So all the glue traces and things like that will be machined off. That's the beauty of this. You don't have to be all that neat about it. But what you do want to do is make sure that there's 100% glue coverage. All right, so there we start with the next piece of holly. Then sandwich some more glue on top. Yeah, we'll go ahead and spread this out just as we previously have done. You can see that's a lot of glue for just one simple piece of this. You know, glue can end up being a significant portion of the guitar, uh, the weight of it if you over apply. But the trick is, is to spread it out thinly and completely, like I'm doing here, and then make sure it's clamped very, very well. So after I laid the parchment paper down, I assembled the stacks, glued them together, and then clamped them. But before I did that, I wrapped the parchment paper all the way around the uh, package, so to speak, so it prevents any glue drips from getting onto surfaces, getting onto the clamps, etc. And then I'll unwrap it once it's cured and dried. It helps it to cure and dry a little better, too, when it's wrapped up like that. So we've got ebony, holly, purple heart, holly, ebony. Five pieces right there that are laminated together. It's going to take a day to dry, and then we're ready to go for the next portion. While we're waiting for the body sections to dry with the uh, holly and ebony veneer contrast stripes on them, uh, there's some work we need to do on the neck. Okay, The first thing is this, and this is just a preference on my part, but I think you'll understand it once you look at the entire uh, set up in the, the entire project as a whole. But right now, this neck blank has a body thickness of 1.75 inches. And that's one and three quarter inches thick all the way down. So correspondingly, the Purple Heart body sections that are gonna be glued to this are gonna be one and three quarter inches as well. That's going to be a very heavy instrument when you get a full uh, 17 and 3 quarter inch width on it. So what I want to do 
is I actually want to mill this down so that I can get it to about a one and a half inch thickness, maybe one and three eighths, preferably. And then the whole body will be thinner, hence lighter. Um, if you look at the uh, original Gibson uh, SG double necks, uh, they were somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half inches thick. So I think that's what I'm going to aim for. And let me show you how I'm going to do that. Okay. Now, what I want to do is run this through my planer. Okay. But to do that, if you notice, the neck, the fingerboard, is actually jutting up from the top of this surface. So if it was to ride on the planer board, it would be tilted this way and not flat. What I need to do is raise this up somehow so that the entire surface is parallel to the planer bed as it goes through. So the planer mills off a uniform section of this. Do you remember when we did the cutout for the template, the original double body template, to mark out the neck sections and the side and center sections? Well, those pieces that we had left over from the where the maple neck blank were laid out actually make a perfect way to shim this up and get the neck off of the planer board. So with some double stick tape, I'll put that on here, and then all of a sudden we've got a nice level surface to ride through the planer, and we can safely and accurately mill down the thickness of these neck blanks because the thickness of these blanks are what determines the thickness of the uh, Purple Heart body sections. So uh, let's go ahead and get started on getting that reduced from one and three quarter to one and a half inches. Okay, our purple heart with the uh, laminate trim, contrasting trim, uh, blocks have set up and dried. So now what we're going to do is put them through the planer to mill them flat, okay? So uh, this is just a process because we've got to get this the thickness of the next that we've just milled down to one and three eighths. See that that cleaned up all the glue, and you can really see the uh, contrasting stripes really nicely. So now I've just got to keep working on this to get it down to the uh, one and three eighths inch thickness for the center parts of the body, and then the next will fit to this, and then we have the outside body edges to uh, mill down. But uh, going to keep on grinding away, making sawdust. So I've got my template pieces, I've got the body parts clamped together and lined up properly, and now it's just simply a matter of tracing the line.
And then once that's done, I will take this back. And take it to the bandsaw and cut it to form. Now I'm going to cut it close to shape but not to the shape because I'm going to use these templates in my router table to uh, perfectly get the side square and exactly to the shape of these routers. So it's going to take a little bit of work to cut this out because this is really thick stuff and Purple Heart's fairly dense stuff. But uh, to the bandsaw we go. Before we glue up the body sections and the neck blanks and make one whole guitar, um, it's best to go ahead and carve your peg head while the neck is still in this state because it's going to be easier to move around the shapers and the saws and things like that that you're going to need to use. You don't want to be hauling around a huge guitar body along like this while you're trying to run it through an oscillating sander. So um, what I've got are uh, these templates that I've devised. And uh, one side is six strings spaced for Cluson style tuners. And then the second space is for uh, die cast or self-contained tuners like Grovers or Shalers or things like that. So, so um, to me, I'm going to do a symmetrical peg head on the 12 string, which means that it's going to be a mirror image lengthwise. You know, it's going to be uh, exactly measured. So the first real critical thing is to identify the center mark or the center line of the peg head in the neck because everything flows from that center line there. So I always use a small razor knife to do this because it's a very fine blade and it's a very accurate measurement. So I've got 39.6 uh, millimeters, uh, I'm sorry, 39.6 inches, 39.6 millimeters, sorry, um, across the width. So 19.8 uh, is halfway. So what I'm going to do is mark 19.8 inches with a slight indentation of the razor blade knife and then the same thing on this side and then we'll turn around and measure the same way from the other side okay and what you'll invariably find is that both center line marks don't exactly line up and that's because of things like the you know the thickness of your marking tool and you know various inaccuracies but what you can do is if you measure both sides exactly the same you might have two small marks just the tiniest little bit apart. So if you split the difference, you know you're at true center, okay? The next thing you want to do is take a really sharp pencil and seat it into the knife blade mark you made. Line it up along the other edge and come at it from a very sharp angle and just lightly draw one line. Don't draw multiple lines. Okay, now what you want to do is take your midline measurement and run it right along the edge, and that's dead on. That is perfect. So we've got a dead center mark to start with. Now, if you notice, I'm drawing the back on the back of the peg head, and there's a really good reason for that. Uh, because when you do get to like a flat table sander, like an oscillating sander, or spindle sander, um, it's really hard to get the neck completely flat and parallel to the surface with the frets and the nut resting on the uh, oscillating table. But if you flip it over, the flat part of this is going to be perfect to work on that, okay? So when I draw the center line on the back, there's a main reason in terms of where I lay the tuners out because the tuner takes up more space at the bottom of the tuner with the screw mount than it does at the top where there is no mount. So you have to leave more room starting from the bottom edge of your peg head up to accommodate the tuners, okay? So what I like to do is I like to, I'll take this five, I mean six hole 
uh, template. Now I'm going to do something what of an angle like a flying V style headstock. Okay, so what I'm going to do is mark this exterior line on the template which marks the true edge of what the peg head should be shaped as. And then what we're going to do is just gently draw one line down the edge. Okay. Now, if you want to mirror that, you can sit here and do this kind of guess haphazardly, but there's a better way to do it. What you want to do is take your dial calipers and measure the distance from the edge to this line right here. And I've got 121, 1.21 inches. And then I'm going to take it and transfer it back over here. Okay. Then I'm going to draw a parallel line from where this uh, first line starts because it doesn't start right at the corner. You don't want a really sharp edge. You want to leave some room for shaping and curling, uh, making a corner out of it. Okay. So you want to draw a horizontal line across the back of the peg head uh, that basically denotes where this line starts. And then all you have to do is just connect the two spots, which is a pretty easy thing to do. Okay, so we've got this line here, this line here, and we've got a parallel headstock shape that is symmetrical. All right, now what we want to do is lay out the tuners, obviously. So using the same template guide, I'm going to lay this right along the line that I had marked. leaving enough room at the bottom as well as enough room at the top. And I'm going to mark my first set of tuner holes. I like to draw the entire circle rather than try and guess at a center punch line on the hole. And uh, that to me is just a better way to do it because after the holes drilled, it seems to be, I mean holes marked like this, it seems to be a lot easier to find the exact true center for your hole. Now, after I've got this first line of six done, what I want to do is draw horizontal lines across here that help me figure out where I'm going to be with the next set of center lines. And what I'm doing this for is from the edge of the top of the hole rather than, like I said, try and guess a center line. You can also go ahead and mark a center line point within the hole. Be careful, this takes a lot of practice because you got to really take into account the width of your pencil head when you're actually laying down your marker, you'll be off. Because what you see from where the tip is entering to where the tip actually hits is a little different. So anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to take that right there and we're going to draw a horizontal line through the middle of the hole second horizontal line and I like to use different size rulers because it really kind of helps me gauge parallel a little more accurately and then just keep moving yourself up through all six string places locations until you've got six horizontal lines that are evenly spaced perfectly parallel to each other and situated comfortably on the headstock. And there you go. There's my headstock template design roughed out. Of course, we're going to do some curves and some nice aesthetic designs with this, but that's in essence what it's going to look like. All I need to do now is just mark the center lines of these holes and go ahead and uh, punch and drill those.
tip when working with maple especially. It chips really easily. So you don't want sharp edges around your drilled holes because that's where chips start. So what I use is this beveling stone. It's just a, uh, you know, for like grinding valves and things like that. You can usually get these in kits. They're not expensive. fits in a drill. And what I do is just run it real lightly through each hole just to kind of chamfer the inside of each hole. And then you have a smooth rounded edge leading into each hole and out of each hole. And it makes it just that much less prone to chipping. So this is what I do. And that's it. You really can't see it on the video, but uh, you can sure feel it. And I'll just flip it around and do the same back side the same way. Nice new flat single edge razor blade and just burnish the edge here. Now what you'll see as you start getting a finish off is you'll start seeing a lot of this these flakes here. See? Like this real fine white dust. And that lets you know that there's still finish on the side of that neck. And what you want to keep doing is just burnishing, lightly rubbing back and forth with the blade at a reverse angle. And when you get really good at it, over years you can do it really quick like this. You get the movement down with your hand and it becomes second nature to you. But what we're going to do is just keep running this all the way down. Now at the end you want to be careful not to nick the end. So what I always do is cock the end blade just a little bit and that way it can run off the edge and you're still supported and not you know rounding over this should take you about five minutes to do carefully but uh, once you do it carefully you'll be glad you did because the surface will be completely flat very smooth and free of any sealant or finish so just keep doing it until you start getting a white powder, like a maple colored powder. See, as long as you're getting this white dust here, that dust right there, that's finish. Looks like a recreational habit from the 80s, but it's not. Okay, when you stop seeing that, you know that you're through to the wood. You can also feel the wood because it has a slightly rougher texture than the sealer finish itself. All right, so it's time to glue the center section to the necks themselves. And what I'm going to do is instead of putting glue on the neck, glue on and then gluing this to it, and then putting glue on this and gluing that neck to it, I'm going to apply glue to both sides of the center section, set it down into place, position it properly, and then clamp it in. So basically it's the same kind of routine where we want to make sure we're using plenty of glue, filling up all voids, making a really good, firm, secure connection because you don't want this thing splitting apart. All right, and once again, I'm just going to use my finger spread it so every interior surface of this joint is covered with a nice even coat of glue and then I'm going to just flip it over and I'm going to do the same thing to this side. We have to do this kind of quick so that the uh, glue underneath doesn't run down but uh, don't want to also have it all spill out onto the uh, work surface while I'm getting ready to glue it. I use parchment paper, by the way. Parchment paper is uh, something you find in your kitchen aisle, but it definitely doesn't stick to anything, and that's a good thing. So there we go with that. And then here we go with you. This needs to come up a little bit here. And then... Okay, 
So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and clamp this together. Real lightly at first, you just want to make it even so it doesn't shift on you. And you clamp at both edges to start until you see glue run up from all the joints. And once you do that, then you get to the center section and bring that together. You don't need to apply a ton of force when you're clamping. But uh, then what I usually do after I get the center sections is reset the uh, rear end section as well. And like I said, you can just see the glues coming out of joints perfectly, really nicely. I'm gonna get a wet towel and wrap this all up. But before we finish that, the important thing is, is that everything, the top surfaces are gonna be flat onto this, whoops, are gonna be flat onto the uh, marble top that I have here. That way we can work and level and sand the back a lot easier because there's no fingerboard extensions getting in the way. So that's it. Just got to do a little bit of cleaning up and a little bit more clamping. Before you glue the body sections on, make sure, make sure you chamfer and use the router on the edges if that's what you're looking for. Because otherwise it's really impossible to do it all by hand and do it accurately. I'm gonna do the center sections that way. But uh, these outer body edges, which is really critical for the old professional look of the instrument. So we've got two sections now on either side that are really nicely, nicely rounded. Very soft, very comfortable. This is a uh, quarter inch round over in case you're looking for a technical spec. So I've got here's a little tip. When you're gluing up woods of different types, say for example, when you're going from ebony to maple, which I am here with these neck blanks and the side wings with the veneers, um, ebony is a very oily wood, as is rosewood. And um, the oils prevent the glue from wicking in. The glue is a water-based glue and it wicks into the cell pores of the wood and that's how it locks the wood together. So uh, one trick to make that happen better or more securely is to go ahead and kind of rough sand the edges that you're going to be gluing together. You don't want them really polished to a 600 or 800 grit. I like to sand them to about a 100 to a 120 grit just to rough them up a little bit and that helps the interlock. Um, another thing I like to do too is before I make my glue up, I'll take some acetone, which is an excellent degreaser for wood. It also has a lot of volatile chemicals in it, so you want to use it in a well-ventilated area, and it evaporates quickly so it doesn't raise the grain. So what you want to do is just after you've sanded your wood down and got it to the grit that you're uh, or the density that you're looking for on the grain, just wipe it down really good with a uh, paper towel soaked in a little bit of acetone. And you'll be amazed at how much of the oils. The oils are the reddish, purplish stuff that make the wood look uh, like it looks. But there you go. That's just from rubbing this little strip here, making sure that all the wood oils have been wicked away and rubbed away. And the same thing that we want to do on the maple as well, just to clean that up really well. Then let that dry for about 10 to 15 minutes. Give the uh, wood plenty of time to get rid of the acetone and the volatile chemicals. Make sure it's really good and dry. Then apply your wood glue as normal. Got the center section all glued up and dried for two days. 
Now what I'm going to do is glue one wing on at a time. And the reason I'm doing this is because the width of the body is 17 and a half inches. And I don't have eight clamps that are that will expand to 17 and a half inches long. So what I've got to do is just do one wing at a time. All right, so you glue the body top, because that's the level surface that we're working off of, flat to a backing board that's also very sturdy, very strong, and very flat. You know, spread the glue on the uh, wing, the body wing. I'm going to go ahead and thin it out and even it all the way across the surface like we always do. And then what we're going to do is go ahead and uh, clamp this to the board as well. Before I glued anything to the ebony and to the maple, I took some acetone in a paper towel and wiped both of them down to get all the oils off, especially the ebony, which is a very oily wood. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and set this in place onto the body. And then what I'm going to do is clamp it in several places. Ah! So that it uh, basically won't move around when I secure it. and it stays flat on the top surface to the board. Okay, Believe me, if you're a word worker, you can never have enough clamps, people. It's just a fact of life. Okay, so we've got that. We're already getting some squeeze out there. That's a good sign. Okay. So checking our bottom edge, we're good there. We're good on the top. Now what we're gonna do once all these two pieces, you know, the side wing and the main center section have been glued to the flat surface. Now we're going to start drawing it together. And I'm going to go ahead and start right now with this first center section here. And uh, start there and then I'm going to clamp or work my way out. Getting some real good squeeze out there. Now remember both these Center section and this wing are both flat on this board, so all I'm doing is just drawing them together this way. You know, you don't want to over clamp. You don't want to make a uh, situation worse, you know, by, by uh, denting the wood on the side or whatever. So we're just going to go ahead and pull this one in. And you can see as you tighten the clamp up, you can just see the glue start squeezing out. from the joint, and that is a good thing. We want to get uh, as much of this over squeeze out, but when it's squeezing out, it means the joint's full. And that's important because you don't want to have any gaps in the wood. You want to have a full, complete contact body. And uh, it's just a better way to do things. All right, so we've got these two together. Now we're going to provide some auxiliary clamping in some different places just to give it a chance to really, really, really set. And uh, for this one, we'll have to feed this one through this way. But we've got that there. And we'll go ahead and pull this in. And there goes the rest of the squeeze out. This is going to be a good joint. Now, on some of these sur uh, sloped surfaces there, you really can't get them uh, because they're going to uh, slide off as you do, and you might dent the wood, okay? So I think that's pretty good for what we're looking for here. We've got uh, full contact and full squeeze out of the glue all along the joint. And now we wait. We've got the rest of the body pieces all glued together. Then after I did that, I trimmed the lower bow according to the design templates that we had created at the start of this project. And then I uh, took the quarter inch round over bit on my router table and went ahead and rounded that edge off to match the rest of the, uh, of the body. So uh, there you go. We've got an offset, but a slant forward offset, much like the Moserites, you know, the flipped over fender aesthetic. And uh, we've got the 12 string on the lower because the headstock being longer kind of accentuates that flipped forward aspect. And then the six string on top. 
Next thing we're going to do is uh, do some fine sanding on this, but before uh, we get to the fine sanding, we're going to do the pickup layouts, the bridge and tailpiece and control layouts. We're going to route for everything and get this body ready for finishing. But uh, the hard part is done. And here we are with this beautiful, cool double neck guitar that uh, is made from Purple Heart and the MGB Guitars six string neck blanks on both sides. These are the neck blanks, as you can see, that I made a 12 string out of. And the same thing you can do a six string or a four string or an eight string or anything else you want. They're really fantastic products, uh, really well made. And they're a lot of fun to have a project such as this. Uh, so check them out, MGB Guitars. I'm Will Kelly, this is Hard Knocks Guitars, and thanks for watching. Thank you.